And today we have some members of our Brain Injury Advisory Council here to talk about brain injury as an invisible disability. But first I thought I would let the uh, members kind of introduce themselves, say a little bit about kind of their own uh, background and experience. Uh, we'll start with Kelly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm from Leesburg, Virginia, and I have been a both a brain injury survivor and caregiver to a daughter when we were involved in a car accident in 2001. Um, I'm now we're, we co-wrote a book with my husband, The Miracle Child, Traumatic Brain Injury Me, about our um, experience with brain injury. And I also co-lead this council. And I also have been a communications trainer with the Nova Hospital Systems and part of the National Center Advancing Person Center Practices and Systems and their TBI Advisory Leadership Group. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. And Darcy? Hi, I'm Darcy Keith. I am from Fishers, Indiana. I am 30, 32 years post. Um, I am active on the Ohio State uh, Advisory Council for the Brain Injury Research. <clears throat> I'm a professional speaker um, in the brain injury community. I speak at conferences, associations, and other things like that, as well as serving on several brain injury grants that are currently active. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you. And Stacia? Sure. Hi. Uh, I'm Stacia Bissell. I'm a brain injury survivor 12 years out. My TBI occurred uh, from a bicycle accident. Uh, I was out of work for about a year. I was a public school administrator and educator, math teacher for many years. I've since retired from that career due to my TBI. I now serve as coach, educator, author, advocate, and speaker on behalf of the brain injury community. Plus I'm a council member for the Brain Injury Association of America. And I just want to say thanks for being here with us today. It should be pretty helpful for you to hear different perspectives and stories on this topic. Yes, thank you. And Angela? Thanks for joining us today. My name is Angela Lee Tucker, and I live in Asheville, North Carolina. I sustained a TBI 15 years ago. I'm a member of this advisory council for six years, time flies when you're having fun, and a writing group called The Story I'll Tell. I help organize a support group in Western North Carolina, and I co-wrote a book about my injury titled, Me Now, Who Next? And I also contributed to Chicken Soup for the Soul, Recovering from TBIs. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us today and talking about brain injury as an invisible disability. So we'll get right into it and we'll start with uh, Stacia. So what does invisible disability mean to you? Yeah, so as a brain injury survivor, uh, this invisible disability puts both you and me on a bit of a confusing line. Number one, I'm going to smile at you and wave and try not to make you feel the burden of my situation as often as I can. And two, I understand that if I look like I usually do, how could others know how hard it is for me to navigate the road in front of me sometimes? Although this is where you non-survivors out there come in and we all hope you get curious and ask questions and try to learn and to understand. And three, when I do research, uh, sorry, not research, reach, um, or even surpass my threshold because my symptoms are greater than my management skills, I really appreciate grace, kindness, understanding, even though you may feel maybe a little duped by me perhaps because I led you to believe that I could handle more than I am. Please remember that brain injury doesn't change a person's intellect or kindness or soul. It really just changes our processes for doing things. How about you, Kelly? What do you think? I agree with all you said, Stacia. Um, I think of invisible disability as an umbrella term for a bunch of other disabilities that we never even think about, um, you know, people who have physical, you always think of the physical impairment, but there are so many other disabilities that fall under that umbrella. Obviously the brain injury, which is look at all of us sitting here today. None of us, you would never guess that any of us suffer from a brain injury. And yet we do. And we have symptoms every single day. And we have learned how to compensate for those symptoms and also how to cope with those symptoms 
to make it easier for us to get through our day and you know contribute fully into our lives. But other examples of you know an invisible disability is such as Crohn's disease, chronic migraines, um, fibromyalgia, um, ADHD. Um, those are all under that same umbrella. And so I think just giving kindness to people in general is really what we need to do. I'll go next. <laughs> so invisible disability to me looks like I am, I have everything put together on the outside, but on the inside I don't. So again, I, I reiterate or I agree with everything that Kelly and Stacia has said, but just because you look good on the outside doesn't mean you have it all together on the inside. Um, we deal with constant deficits on a daily basis. I deal with fatigue, um, nerve fatigue, um, just you know, trying to keep it together. So those are some, as, as well as aphasia, um, just you know, com communicating with people. So why you can't see, those of us with brain injury, we have that di invisible disability. We inside are really trying to keep it together um, so that we can function. How about you, Angela? These have never looked as good as we do now. Um, but for me, there are a lot of missing pieces behind this smile. Living with a TBI is an invisible disability because you can't see the deficits I now live with, the debilitating neuro fatigue, the double vision, the memory challenges. I've learned how to be comfortable disclosing about these issues I deal with every day. Excellent. Thank you all for kind of sharing your insights and experiences. The next question. So what are some ways that in which you can respond to someone who says, but you look fine? Uh, we'll start with Darcy. So that's a, a particularly interesting um, thing is that, oh, you look fine. And I would first off, I say thank you. Um, and then I say, you know what, why don't you follow me for a day? you know, walk in my shoes to see what life is like with a brain injury. And um, also, since I do work full time, I just, you know, ask that, so, you know, just, just take it, take a walk in my shoes, um, see what my individual, my invisible injuries are for my daily function. So I think once those inabilities or disabilities come to light, people pay more attention. So it's like the power of suggestion. So if I say, you know what, when you see me yawn, that means I'm tired, um, I have nerve fatigue, or when you see a little bit, me a little bit agitated, my aphasia comes into practice. Um, it just That helps when I share those things. The next person's like, oh, you know what? I need to pay attention to that now. Or when it comes up, they can say, hey, that's right, they have this particular problem. So I think that's when someone says, hey, you look fine. I just, you know, say thank you. But um, these are some of the things that I deal with. So that way they're more aware of it. Um, let's go, Stacia. How about you? Yeah, I, I, I really like what you said, Darcy. Um, you know, so well-meaning people may suggest you're faking it mm -hmm. because they can't see anything wrong. <clears throat> I heard countless times, but you look fine. And it's had sort of this funny effect on me. It it highlighted that I should be better now. And it felt like almost betrayals from people who are supposed to love and understand me. Even though I know my symptoms are real, encounters like this have imprinted a message at times that maybe this was all in my head. It made me, no pun intended, but it kind of made me question things. Um, also, it can sometimes be hard to accurately read the intention behind someone saying, you look fine. Maybe the intention is very sweet. Someone is just trying to make you feel good. Maybe it's rooted in their fears. They want you to be the same so that their life isn't inconvenienced. And they're trying that power of suggestion, you know? Mm -hmm. You look fine, AK, please be fine. So things feel normal. Mm -hmm. It could also be accusatory in some ways when someone says, you look fine. Message received, right? They may be suggesting that you should be over this by now, but that's on them and their lack of understanding, of course. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case, when someone says, I look fine after my brain injury has become the topic of conversation, like Darcy, I usually, first of all, I say thank you. 
And then I add, I'm fortunate to be high functioning. I will always have to contend with some unpleasant post-concussion symptoms that appear on a daily basis, more so when I'm tired, which is often, but I'm working hard to learn the best ways of managing them so that it doesn't impact me or the people I love. Yeah. It can be taxing and I'm doing the best I can. I always add that at the end. I'm doing the best I can. I don't know. Angela, how about you? I can't. Oh, good. The mute button came off. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I, I never expected those close to me to understand the new me. Um, so I helped them learn about my challenges. In fact, you reminded me, Stacia, about yawning. I wasn't aware of neuro fatigue when it was hitting. So I would tell people, hey, if you happen to notice me yawn, will you let me know? Because <laughs> I've got about 10 minutes before I need to be down. Um, while I was living in New York City, a cognitive remediation therapist at NYU Langone reminded, helped me lead a training that we called TBI 101. I brought a boyfriend at the time and I even brought my mom into the session. Because of this, I'm lucky that I never really experienced a lack of understanding within my close friends and family. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, no one has ever said you look fine. Um, people just don't address my brain injury probably because I'm also a caregiver. So I hear it more in reference to my daughter. And when they say, Oh, do we lose her? Mm. There we go. She's back. There we go. You're back. Oh, I didn't know I was gone. Where did I cut off? Sorry. Um, you talked about your daughter being um, a care caregiver. Yeah, so I never really heard the comment. I heard it referenced to her. And depending on who the person was, whether I felt they could benefit from some education, I would give them education. But if I knew that it was going to go in one ear and one out and out the other, I said thank you and walked walked away because I had learned you know, who was gonna be worth my time of ed educating and who was gonna listen and learn from the education. So when people say you look fine, I think there's, you just have to read something in that tone in their, the pl place you are at and how that comment is being referenced to how you address it. Excellent, thank you. All right, next question. How has your invisible disability presented challenges within your own community? And I'm gonna start right back with Kelly. Thanks. Well, for many years, I didn't talk about my own brain injury. Um, we were both injured, but mine wasn't diagnosed till a few months after my daughter was out of inpatient rehab. So all my focus was on getting her home. And it wasn't until we were home for about two months when mine was diagnosed. And as devastating as it was, I cried and got myself back up and said, okay, I have to move on. I have to heal my family. So they are gonna be my priority. Do I recommend this for other people? No, but this is the only way I knew how to do it at the time. I just got up, kept going. When I got fatigued, I had a little bit more coffee. I would try, if I had to get her to nap during the day, I would lay down with her and then, you know, nine times out of time, I would be the one to fall asleep first, not her. But so I just had to build it in somehow because I was running from appointment to appointment to appointment with all types of therapists trying to heal her. We were at the time given that infamous two year window where they said the first two years are gonna be your most important. And I had that clock ticking in my head the entire time. 11 months, 10 months, nine months. Oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? So I, I kind of focused all my energy on healing her and healing my other daughter who, you know, obviously had, um, you know, scars from the injury as well. Um, and my husband who wasn't even there, but I think any, your entire family, whether they were born at the time or not or involved, they are all affected and I tried to take care of all of them. And when she was in elementary school, I had a teacher say to me, wow, she's really learned how to compensate for her injury. And I was so mad. And I said, I don't want her to learn to compensate. She shouldn't have to compensate. But inside I was reeling because I knew how difficult it was to compensate, 
how exhausting. And I didn't want that for her. But it was a realization that, yes, she had learned coping skills that brought her very far and continue to today. Darcy, how about you? Well, <clears throat> since I work full time, I'll speak from that perspective. So when you go to your job, there may be accommodations for you. And that is great because those accommodations are designed to help you succeed. They're not, not meant to say, oh, you have to have help here or you have a problem here. It's, it's designed to help you succeed. Now, one thing I found in the work environment, let's say you decide not to use accommodations and you want to try it on your own. You can't fake it till you make it because you can't fake a brain injury. You can't fake the fatigue, the mental fog, fogginess that might come about, the communication, whatever, whatever deficits you may experience, you can't fake it till you make it. So please don't try to do that. Now, I did have a supervisor which compared me to my other employee or her other coworker, my coworker slash employees, there you go. And, um, it was an unfair comparison because they had more schooling than I did and they were from a different country. So they had different opportunities than I did. And to have me feel part of the team, she had me come over to the home office location every other week. And that was particularly tiring for me. Um, but also it was putting on a stress and I would cry. Um, all the time because I I just didn't understand it was just very unfair. So if you're in an unfair work situation, it's not worth your health and your well-being to be in a, in a situation like that. So you might look at other opportunities for you um, that you can you can do, um, whether it be a job. And it doesn't have to be like a full-time job. It could be a part-time job. It could be something that just keeps you cognitively engaged. But that's what I would say is challenges in the community and, and in the workplace is that um, don't don't fake it till you make it. Um, give yourself some grace. Mm -hmm. So how about you, Stacia? Yeah, Darcy, I love that. Um, you're so right on that. Um, my invisible disability presented challenges in, in the school I was working at. I was no longer able to teach. There was just way too much stimulation in a classroom setting after my brain injury. Plus, I had lost some of my speed and accuracy with mathematics, whereas before I could handle that content and everything else about a busy middle school, you know, the hallways, the lunchroom, the bells, the fire drills. But luckily, leading up to and when I went back to work, I had been doing um, a pseudo administrator's job in a tucked away office for a, you know, a few years anyway, like I said, which mostly worked. When my school changed hands, the new principal saw me as um, capable and chose not to adhere to the accommodations that my neurologist wrote and were on file and said, you know, sent me back to teaching. And, and my accommodation said no teaching, but she put me back in the classroom part time anyway, as well as had me continue with my existing administrative duties. She also added other duties and it all tipped the scales and I couldn't continue working. So my my livelihood changed it was really scary it has been really scary and my social life changed drastically when my doctor pulled me from my job two years after i went back because of the decline in my health and i lost my my career and i would say it was a beloved career my work group was my social life they were my social group and that was really sad the positive of that was that my health improved but that's another topic for another day. On a personal level, I've suffered the loss of relationships because of some unreasonable expectations that some people had of me, which points to the, again, back to the lack of understanding. The combination of this injury being invisible on top of the education that most people do lack around brain injury is a tough mixture, even when they say they understand it or it's not a problem. So one example would be, um, I had a good friend, a special education, no less, who told me if I would get up and do more, I'd get all better. And that was during the acute phase of my recovery. And you know that was not the right approach. That was a tough approach to hear. 
Another relationship closed down in part because of my reaction to being in an overstimulating environment that they wanted to expose me to and expected me to enthusiastically enjoy. These examples trail back to the lack of awareness in others and why there is so much education and understanding needed around brain injury, especially the chronic and invisible nature of it. So Angela, how about you? What's your experience been like? At the time of the car crash that killed my husband, Rich, I was a VP of a PR firm in New York City, and there was no possible way I could return to that level of work and high pressured world. I had just gotten married. Both my first wedding anniversary and my husband's funeral happened while I was in a coma. I woke up a widow and the, with a TBI, and it totally changed the trajectory of my life. Thank you guys for kind of sharing that experiences. All right, next question. So given all this, do you have recommendations or suggestions for asking for help when your invisible injury is flaring up? And we'll start with Angela. When I think I'm interacting with someone who hasn't experienced brain injury, I try to explain my deficits in as friendly a way as possible. For example, thank you friend for sharing your ideas. I'd appreciate your help in helping me understand them better. Because I live with a TBI, you may need to slow down and repeat yourself to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. How do you help people understand you when your injury flares up, Darcy? Well, when I have near fatigue at work, one thing I do is I remove myself from the situation. So this can actually apply to work. It, it could apply to social situation, but I remove myself. And what I mean by that is, so let's say I work, um, start, you know, eight o'clock, come noon, I am just tired. I'm mentally in, in, you know, tired and, and experience that near fatigue. I go to a conference room for my lunchtime. And I may set my timer to help remind me that I only have so much time and I need to get back to work. And sometimes after I eat, I just lay my head down and rest and let my body rejuvenate um, for that the rest of the time. And then at one o'clock until five, when I go back, I feel so much better and so much refreshed. So that is one of the recommendations I can say is to remove myself from the situation. Another thing is like with my neuro fatigue, no, I knew my trigger ahead of time so that I was more aware. So I would say, know what triggers that you have that help your invisible injury come to, to the surface for other people. Because if you know those triggers, then either you can help um, put those triggers at ease, kind of like when you're hangry, you know, you're hangry, you're hungry. So you have maybe a Snickers or, or something else to eat, you know, the trigger ahead of time. Same thing with a brain injury, know what your triggers are and then you know how you can, how you can best um, compensate for that. So Kelly, how about you? I think one thing we have to remember is not only are we dealing with the brain injury itself, but we're carrying around a lot of emotional baggage with us about, you know, planning ahead, um, you know, having that Snickers bar with us or knowing the right words to tell people, this is what I need. So I think we have to give ourselves grace at always. And then I also think, you know, keep, if you feel you need to, you know, tell people what, what your issues and why you're getting fatigued, keep it brief. Don't give them a dissertation about brain injury. Keep it very brief, only the information they need to know. Point them towards more information if they want. Like the Brain Injury Association of America is an excellent choice for them to go to get more information about brain injury so they can educate themselves. And maybe they can come back and say, hey, I read that. Maybe you should take 10 minute breaks every hour. You know, have you ever tried that? Something like that, not dictating to you what you should or should not do, but just helpful information and tell others how your illness limits you. I have to remind my family about my own and I have to speak up and it took me a long time to do that. And I do somehow work in those little times where I have to just decompress. Um, I think it's better for everyone if we all do that, whether you have a brain injury or not. Stacia? Yeah, absolutely, Kelly. It took me a long time to to learn 
to ask and how to ask. But mm -hmm. my the bottom line, my answer to this is yes, do it. <laughs> ask for help when your invisible injury is flaring up. Uh, people want to help and mm -hmm. they don't always know that you're suffering and may need a hand. This can be invisible even to those who knew, know you um, the best in your in your circle. And I've come to realize that when you are at your threshold or you have surpassed it and you just can't manage anymore, it's a really good opportunity for people to see your brain injury. It, it's better for the future for both of you. It's not hidden right then. And so I've, I'm going to take this from a bef before and during um, flare ups uh, angle. I've run into some situations over the, the, the last few years that I spoke up preemptively and asked for special attention to keep me on track, to provide lists or to repeat information or conversations. An example would be my kids' weddings, which were really wonderful, but pretty overwhelming. And I wanted to preserve my energy to be present at them. So I asked for help leading up to those events it's not easy to ask. I get that. And I don't love that kind of attention since everyone is busy, but I realized that people were happy to help and it made all the difference. I even noted how a few key family members just weren't going into much detail with me. They were just telling me where to be and at what time, which was pretty ideal. So now I've taken that approach when making plans with people. When planning starts to feel like it's overloading me, I'll just simply say, hey guys, just tell me where to be and when. And that's a way, that's my way of asking for help. And another example is when I travel with another person, I ask them to make the itinerary since that is almost impossible for me to do, especially if it's a new place and involves a lot of research. I just ask that we review it for the sake of balancing it and to make sure they, I wanna check in with them, they are okay with a plan B in case my symptoms flare. And when symptoms have already flared and are bad, well, that's that's a different story. Um, when I was teaching and symptoms got bad, I would ask a colleague, this was a work example, but if we could combine our classes and co-teach where she would take the lead on instruction and I could take the quieter, less cognitively draining role of circulating the room and working one-on-one -on -one with students who needed help. That's a great model anyway. Another example was a recent wedding, uh, a friend's daughter got married where I was doing great until the music started along with a strobe light. Um, and so I had to say my goodbyes and make a quick exit. At home, uh, on the home front, I've had to ask my significant other if he could read certain pieces of mail like insurance forms and just tell me what steps I need to take. Bottom line, learn to ask nicely, of course, if people would be willing to help, they, they should. Thank you. And thank you all for kind of sharing some experiences and suggestions and uh, tips. So I think this was discussed, but I want to say it's been a couple of, and then we get this question fairly regularly on the helpline. So when someone had commented, did you ever encounter a misunderstanding from any like doctors or medical professionals who may have either uh, misdiagnosed or minimized symptoms? And if so, how did you deal with that? We'll start with, I'll start with uh, Darcy first, I guess. So fortunately, I have not had that experience um, because when I was initially um, had my brain injury, people could tell that I needed assistance. So I never had that. But Kelly, you might have had that experience. Kelly and, Kelly and Stacia, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had it a lot. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, and I'm, and I've had, it's happened with neurologists who you would expect would have some medical knowledge of what to look for in brain injury. And I have had to educate them about how you talk to someone who has a brain injury and how you change your bedside manner, because they may not process the questions as quickly as you may like, as they may like them to, and to have patience and understanding and repeat questions when there's not an, you know, when obviously the person doesn't understand the question, rephrase it, reframe it, make it simple. Um, and you know, it, you walk away, you know, hitting your head against the wall thinking, oh my gosh, if a neurologist can't understand a brain injury, who else? But then in other ways, I've had, you know, general practitioners who totally 
fully understand what happens when someone has a brain injury and what are some of the deficits they deal with and have made recommendations that were astounding. So I think, again, it all comes back to communication and education are the two biggest things that any of us can do. Agreed. I don't know, Stacia, you had some. Yeah, I, so I, uh, I would say for the most part, I've had an amazing team of doctors, clinicians around me from the, from the start. Um, my, um, I think for me, it was uh, primary care that was the hardest. And I know they have to be so broad. I felt after a while, after I'd learned about brain injury, I'd done my research and reading and all that, I found that I was going in and, and um, talking about it at a level that I hadn't been able to have a level of that conversation at that point with my PCP. And so I was bringing things there instead of having it, having suggestions come here. Um, and then I would be given permission to like, sure, I'll give you a referral there, but I kind of had to come to the table with that. So that was a little concerning. But the other thing that has happened with me is that on the flip side, I've had other things going on that my brain injury has been blamed for. Oh, you have a pain in your leg that we can't figure out? That must be your brain injury. Your brain can't, you know, um, process the pain or something like along those lines. And that has been a, a little bit of an issue. Excellent. Thank you. It's a, it's a question that we get fairly regularly. And to me, it's the same issue, just a different environment. It's the mm -hmm. idea of they don't have an understanding. It's an invisible mm -hmm. disability. There still needs to be that opportunity to potentially educate the medical professional about, you know, yeah. what you're experiencing, kind of what can be helpful. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, we've all had that experience of kind of sharing information with others and it just, it's like hitting a wall, right? They're not, they're not ready to hear that or absorb that info at that time. So, um, but I think it's it's important to remember that regardless of the environment, there are gonna be folks who maybe don't have that awareness or understanding and it's an opportunity to write, share a little info, um, you know, use us as a resource. Um, we get those requests a lot for folks to kind of share information from us with their medical professionals. So it's coming from an objective third party rather than you know, something that they found online, it's coming from a certified brain injury specialist, it's coming from an you know, organization that does this stuff. So that can be helpful sometimes. Um, but that was the question that I saw and I that rang a bell with me that I felt like that was a, another kind of factor that folks experience that kind of invisible disability part sometimes. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for, um, coming and uh, sharing your experiences, your insights, your expertise. We hope uh, folks have found this to be helpful. This in and of itself can be a, a useful learning tool to share with others, to help others understand like, yeah, this does happen a lot. Um, as always, if folks have questions, comments, you're more than welcome to contact us at the Brain Injury Association of America. Um, we hope everybody has a great rest of the day and a great weekend. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.